The mind is our reality simulator. Since everything, any car, black hole, person, stone or creature that exists in the universe is located somewhere in physical space, this three-dimensional nature of all things must be reflected in our mental model of the world. Mental space functions as the unconscious blackboard of the mind. Mental space psychology studies the spatial basis of cognition. Okay, so you've now found the position of the past that way, future that way, present in front of you. Take hold of your present with both hands. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's quite a nice big presence already. Yeah. 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 Can you make it even it's, larger? It's, it's like a horizon. It's, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Can you make the horizon even wider and see if that feels different? Yeah, yeah, very, very good feeling, yeah. And semantic space uh, is really built upon the, uh, the concepts of both the social panorama and the timeline that we externalize things. And one of the things we always look for is, is the here and now. And one of the questions I ask people constantly uh, after we find out their, their future and their past is, where's now? And some people, some people, the space of now is, is very close to them. Some is further out. Some it's, it's very far out. And so um, uh, I usually tell the story of a man I met, a business owner, who was having who, who was prescribed by a medical doctor for stress management and he came in in hyper um, uh, activity and hypertension and high blood pressure and I asked him where now was and he said he said right here and and he took a deep breath and it, high breath and it was just right here and I said so this is today this is how far today goes out and he said yes and I said, well, what if it went out here? Or what if it went out here? And he, he literally, his shoulders literally dropped as he took a breath and, and said, well, that'd be wonderful if, if this could be today or now. Now, I, myself, and you. Now, think about this one. When you think about I, whereabouts is I? Uh, when I think about I, where is it in me, you mean? Oh, there I go. <laughs> <laughs> You're getting it. So, yeah. Yeah, whereabouts is I? I is, uh, is here. For me. Right. Yeah. You never thought about it this way before. No. Now, think about this. When you say I is here, is that literally out there in space in front of you, or are you indicating somewhere else? I'm, I'm a bit confused where I is. Um, uh, I is for me, yeah, just like the letter, kind of the straight up. Yeah. And it's like here. Yeah, like it's here. like here. Okay. Mental space doesn't have the same type of objectivity. It is not an object. It is not an objective space. To say something is spatial gives us the impression as if there was something similar to a room or similar to a country in which we position certain things. And I would say that in the mental space there's only an as-if positioning. We have the impression as if certain objects were positioned in a certain space, but neither are these objects there, nor is the space there. But we need these, you could say, inner objects and inner spaces for modeling, for getting access, for planning, for remembering, and for giving messages about our experience. In the history of our science, only a handful of psychologists recognize the importance of space and experience. However, most others overlooked it, similar to how early physicists overlooked gravity. So, 
It's one of Feldenkrais's big contributions to the whole question of movement, movement education, to bring in at the very beginning and then keep it in focus the role of gravity in terms of how we orient ourselves in space. Before we are born, we are mostly swimming. We are mostly in a liquid environment, and gravity is there, but it's not the, not the overwhelming uh, influence. As soon as we are then born, suddenly we're at the, uh, under the influence of this funny thing that wants us to be on the floor. And we want to be up. We want to get up there because that's in some ways our gift as human beings is to be able to stand up and move around and look around and be very, very, um, uh, how shall I say, we are, ex we are specialists in instability in moving through instability. In order to find that movable quality, uh, upright movable quality, we go through this long apprenticeship of rolling around on the floor and doing all the stuff that we do as babies, playing around with movement in space, so that we can find our way up. I look at how somebody is standing, and I ask myself, how does this person imagine that they are standing in gravity in such a way that they are doing a lot of work up here? That is, why when she is standing does she have to be working here? Some, somewhere in Angelica's image of standing is the idea or the pattern that work must be done in the shoulders and neck in order to stand up freely. So then the question is, how can we work with movement in such a way that she develops another image, a, broad, uh, a wider image, whereby she can stand up and she doesn't have work happening here. I'm sure you can think of somebody who is emotionally very close to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, somebody sure. Somebody you yeah. love. Um, I'd very much like to know where that person is around you. If you... Uh, First of all, concentrate on the feeling that you have for that person and make that feeling really live for yourself. And when you feel it, strengthen that feeling a bit. And then show me where that person is. Um, the person is right, right in front of me. Right in front of yeah. you. And with right in front of you, are we talking closer than a meter or...? Yeah, closer than closer a meter. Than a meter. Okay. Mm -hmm. And which direction are they looking? They're facing me. Facing you? Yeah. And uh, if you look at the height of the level of the eyes, is that the same, lower or higher? Pretty much Pretty the, much same. the same. Yeah. Level. yeah. Mental space psychology was developed over the last 15 years from clinical work and laboratory experimentation. Foremost, clinical applications like timeline therapy, family constellations, psychodrama, social panorama and clean space promise that cognitive psychology can make a leap if attention is paid to the phenomenon in mental space. Yeah, you're laughing. You don't know what we're doing at the moment, but uh, we've walked up two floors mm -hmm. in this house where you've never been before. Mm -hmm. And while walking up here, you will have formed some sort of mental image yeah. of what this house is like. Yeah. So what I'm going to ask you to do now is to close your eyes and to walk down to the front door. We'll make sure that nothing goes wrong. Oh. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm doing this.
I used to work in brain surgery and just before I left, in the, in the few weeks before I finished working there, we had one of the surgeons started to carry out a, a new type of surgery. He was the first one in the UK to be doing this. And it was on a particular type of neurological problem that, that people had. Now, the, the patients undergoing this, this surgery were all new to us as well as nurses. So there was various phenomena that we started to observe that we'd never actually seen before. Now, in the time that I was still there, we had four, four patients who had all had identical surgery in the, same, in the same week. And what was interesting was that they were, they were never quite asleep. They were never really fully awake in, in their recovery time um, in, the, in the initial couple of weeks. They, they were kind of in this twilight world of consciousness where they were fully, fully conversant and able, able to talk and behaviorally totally appropriate in their behavior. Unlike some people who could get quite confused and disorientated, they were always orientated to time and place and always behaviorally appropriate. But here was the thing that was absolutely noticeable. And when we first started seeing it, nurses were discussing it. Is this actually what they're doing? Is this really what's happening? And as time went on, it became obvious that this is what they were doing. They were physically here in the here and now, and they could see the corridors, they could see the beds, they could see other patients. But also they were in this internal map of, of the place, um, which for each of them, it was fixed. So for example, one lad, he, he was quite young, um, he was a, a, a massive cricket fan. He played cricket for the school and all that kind of stuff. And he was permanently playing cricket. He was inside this timeless cricket match so it was like a waking dream. So even though he's physically here, mentally, he's also bilocated into this cricket match. There was another guy staying with a sporting theme. He was, his horse racing was his thing. So he was at the, at the racetrack. Another lady, she, um, her thing, she was at, at, in her apartment. So she was very much at home as well as being here simultaneously. And I, I forget who the, what the fourth one was doing. Now, that was, that was what we began to observe until the patients were able to get up and out of bed and go out, say, to the bathroom, for which they would need two nurses to assist just to help steady them because it was still early days in their recovery. That's when it got, got interesting. The first time I experienced it, we're taking the guy who's at the racetrack out to the bathroom. So he's up out of bed and we start walking up the corridor and he's fairly subdued, but he's, he's conversant. And he says, well, hang on, hang on a minute, guys. Hang on a minute. I, I, we just got to wait. And I said, what, what have we got to wait for? He said, we're going to get run over by the horses. The horses were coming round, round the track. And he had to wait until they had all gone past before he could then move forward up the corridor. But also he was moving at equidistant through his, through his mental thing of the horse race track. And we had similar, similar kind, kind of things on the way back. Now, the lady who was in her apartment at home, um, th when she was downgraded from being high dependency to, to moderate dependency in terms of nursing interventions, as she was moving through her recovery, they moved her bed from where it was, really just not that many yards, but just around the corner from where she was, into a, into a quieter section of the ward. She started freaking out. What they had done is in her mental map that she was living through, they had moved her out of the window and now she was suspended in midair in her bed outside of her apartment. And initially it was kind of just wait till she calms down, but she wasn't calming down. Now, logistically, there was nowhere else to put her and the bed that she was in is now occupied by a high dependency patient and we don't have any other place to, oh, it became problematic. So there was a lot of reorganization on the department that had to happen so we could move her into a place where she wasn't freaking out because she was no longer in midair. Now this was kind of a weird thing for me to experience and, and for the other staff as well because it was, it was quite new. But it kind of highlighted an interesting facet for human consciousness. Often we have our mental pictures and they go with us everywhere that we go and that I can make a picture here off to the left and it can bother me and I can go downstairs into another room and it's still there up to the left. But there is aspects of experience where as we physically move, we move through that mental space as well.
So do you like fruit? Not really. Okay. What do you like to eat? Potatoes. Uh huh. Okay. So I'm going to ask you a bit of a strange question. Okay. Um, might help to close your eyes. Mm -hmm. So when you think of a potato, mm -hmm. where is that? In my cupboard at home. Uh huh. Okay. And can you point to it in your mental space now? What do you mean? So, when you think of a potato, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm presuming there is. You're, you're aware of a potato somewhere in the space around you. Oh, I see. You mean like physically? Yeah. Uh, there. Okay. So, first one is mm -hmm. think of something that you know for sure that you'll definitely do today um, before the end of the okay. day mm -hmm. and where is that that's there okay is that right at the end of your finger uh yeah just kind of just there, there. okay can i ask you to open your eyes for a second mm -hmm. um so if this was you mm -hmm. uh, it's been a while since i did art <laughs> Uh, at GCSE. Could you draw the item, the thing that you definitely do before the end of today, okay. or is in relation to you? Great. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's that one. Um, and now I'd like you to think of um, something, an activity, that, a specific activity that you have been, you haven't done for a while, but you'd like to do. So something maybe you've been putting off or you haven't got around to? Um, can't even get in the thought, it's hard. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm trying to think of something. Okay, yeah, I uh -huh. got it. Okay, so is it a specific thing that you could do in one go rather than it's not like build a house? No, it's a specific thing. Yeah, great, yeah. okay. Um, and where is that? That's right there. It's where? It's sort of there. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, so could you draw that? Um, I'm trying to just think. Mm -hmm. Okay. But when we look at the fine structure of the way how language games are used in the form of life, in all these cases, spatial arrangements of the speakers, the ways how they experience their body and the body of other people, how they experience the different forms in which messages and uh, uh, meanings are given, and um, also the symbolic arrangements that are typically used in the culture. So, for instance, in certain cultures, it would be very normal to give the hand and shake it. In other cultures, it would be much more polite to bow down. Um, now, uh, when we look at all these differences, there might be the idea that there is nothing that is general in these aspects of language. And what the approaches that I mentioned before, the psychodrama of Moreno, the work of Virginia Zatia, uh, the uh, constellation work and in our case the structural constellation work or your form of the social panorama what they have in this respect in common that we are looking for universals so certain aspects of arrangements that are more or less cultural independent parts that go beyond the verbal language so to give a very simple example when we speak with somebody about an ambivalence you always find, in nearly all cases, uh, you find some easily detectable attractors for the alternatives. So, uh, somebody might say, well, I'm still somehow doubting whether I should do A or B. And maybe the body language is more expressive and he says, I'm doubting whether I should do A or I should do B. But it can be very reduced and he might just say, well, I'm still not decided between A and B. But still, you have these two attractors, and they might even be more minimal. I had a client who talked to me and said, 
well, I'm always trying to do A, but I'm again then doing B. But when I then try to decide B, suddenly I'm doing A. And the whole, bo whole body language was condensed in his index finger. But what these very different gestures have in common is that there is an oscillation between two attractors. Therefore, if you speak with somebody who you don't know, and you speak with him about two alternatives, and you say, and just suppose, very often people suddenly have ideas about the third position, about the both, that they didn't have whilst you were moving your hands in that way. So you could say, on the one hand this, on the other hand that. Well, no, just consider. It's a way in which this is not just gesture, but it also uses some universal structure of speaking about ambivalences especially if you, for instance, expand it by the one side, the other side, both, and if you consider it from a different perspective. Now we have already the structure of the tetralemma from ancient Indian and later Buddhist logic, the one, the other, both, and neither, neither being the new perspective. Now, this is not just in the realm of abstract alternatives, because you, for instance, could speak about a group of people and when you say, well, how have things developed between you and your colleague? And the other one might say, well, we have drifted apart a little bit. And very probable when he says drifted apart, he would make rather this movement. I've never seen somebody who said, we have become so far from each other, moving the hands towards each other. So you will have um, some movement that very often symbolizes some distancing. But these movements can express much more. So if you, for instance, say, well, if I rightly understood what you told me, it's a question of you and your closest colleague and the different opinions that you have in this project and how the clients will react. Now suddenly there are nine elements because there are two people speaking and this is the symbol for the one person I spoke with. It's a question of you and your closest colleague. This hand became a symbol for the colleague and the different opinions. Now this hand became a symbol for my uh, the opinion of my uh, dialogue partner. This hand became a symbol for the opinion of his closest colleague in this project. So we have a fifth element here and how different parts of your clients will react. So we have number six and seven. So I'm just saying this and we have already a little spatial arrangement with seven elements and two people speaking. This is happening all day long, all the time. And because different people have so different styles in speaking, for a long time the logical structures of this have not so well been noticed. William James, Jacob Moreno, Julian James, Virginia Satir, Richard Bandler, Bert Heilinger, Barbara Chaversky, Steve Andreas, Connie Ray Andreas, David Groves, Moshe Feldenkrais. And what you see here is uh, the center of self, which uh, can vary a lot, but that's uh, uh, the core of the body, you could say, the place where the person exists in a way in the universe. And this is connected to an image here called the self-image, but in fact that's uh, a collection of images that is used to know who you are. And so they can vary uh, according to the context that the person operates in. Then here around you see something that uh, Andy was talking about. He was talking about orientation in space, in yeah, physical space. And we must assume that any creature uh, needs a sort of uh, navigational system to not get lost. And so uh, everywhere where we go we represent the environment when we can. When my son died at the age of 27, uh, I was not prepared for it and I had no tools or ways even though I had extensive NLP training and other training in the field of development, but I really didn't have the tools to deal with the intensity of emotions. And um, I had an amazing opportunity to be in a seminar where yet again I listened to the lecture on the importance of locations. 
and I volunteered for a demonstration. I had, it has been at that point eight years since my son died and the intensity of emotions was still overwhelming at days and other days were good days. And during that demo I realized that how fundamental the location was. My deceased son, uh, personification, was fairly close on my left and that contributed, as I understand it today, to the intensity of mourning and grieving and feelings I, I still had on those bad days. On the good days everything seems fine but it took me a long time to recover because I constantly had this location in the back of my mind. I had his personifications, his image fairly close to me, slightly to my left. And during that demonstration I was guided to place him in a different location, in a location well above where my diseased father was located, his personification, where I didn't have any intense feelings. In fact, I was at peace with the death of my father. So those two locations, in my experience, turn out to be absolutely fundamental to where I am at today with the death of my son. I was guided during this demonstration to shift the location of personification of my son in the direction of my deceased father. It wasn't as easily done as it sounds. We didn't simply switch the locations, but I was guided in a beautiful ecological and very, very touching way to allow my son, his personification of course, to start moving towards his grandfather. And during that work I had a beautiful conversation with my son and I understood how letting go and allowing him to go to that location not only for me would bring me at peace and reduce the intensity of feelings. In fact today I don't have any intense feelings. I'm happy that he's on the way to his grandfather. So when I looked at the other location I'm at peace. I know he died but I don't have any strong and intense feelings that I had till the moment of that demonstration. And in this location here I chose to set up a rose garden. So I go there now to this location where previously were a lot of tears. I go today to smile and to smell the roses. So when I look up on my son in that location on the way together, almost together with his grandfather, he's taking slow steps in that direction. I'm at peace. Okay. So you have written or drawn what it is you'd like to work with in this process? Yes. So place that where it needs to be. And place yourself where you need to be in relation to that. And what do you know from here? I know that I got into heavy. It's in, it's in my immediate uh, area. And I'm happy with it being there and I'm happy to work on it. And is there anything else from there 
that you know about that? I know that it's possible. I know that I've got to do it with Richard. It's going to be possible with both of us. So I have to do it for me and with him. Okay. And what could this space be called? So this space is now. So just write that and mark that space. Okay. And find another space. And what do you know from there? I know that I can see what's happening and that there will be an after time. And I want to do the best I can. And um, uh, David's Grove work is, uh, has similarities with uh, the constellation work of Hellinger and um, the NLP spatial work. Um, it um, is informed by the um, Lakoff and Johnson's work on uh, embodied metaphor. And they're all kind of using the same principle um, and coming at it from different angles and using it in different ways. Um, but the basic principle is that space is the core of our perception and that everything that, ex that we imagine and we feel exists somewhere in space and that the relations, the spatial relationships are primary to our organizing our inner world and making sense and getting meaning of it. What David Grove brought was this notion of working cleanly and as much as possible keeping the facilitators' words and assumptions and metaphors out of the process. He also had this idea that in doing that, as the space takes on uh, this life, it becomes psychoactive and the client starts reacting to the symbols that are around inside and starts having um, new thoughts and feelings about those. But he had this term, he said that the space will become your co-therapist. And what he meant by that was, the space will effectively start asking some questions. It will pose questions to the, to the client that the therapist doesn't need to do anymore. The more psychoactive the space becomes, the more the client engages with their own inner and outer symbols, the less the therapist has to do and the more of a back seat David Grove would take and that we take in our process uh, symbolic modeling which is our version of David Grove's approach the therapist can take a back seat and has to do less and less and less and just occasionally drop in a question to keep the process flowing in its own direction and that's the space becoming the co-therapist or the co-coach. And find another space. And what do you know from there? This is the actual time when it's happening, when I'm doing it. And is there anything else you know from there about that? that actually I should be looking this way. And what could this space be called? One of the main ideas underlying this whole concept of mental space is that human thinking and human talking is accompanied by an underlying process of ongoing mental imagery. And one of the most fascinating uh, discoveries was that this ongoing process of mental imagery somehow is spatially organized and that this has a lot of influence on human 
subjective experience and also behavior and also capabilities. One of the early hints about the spatial organization of mental imagery came from Richard Bandler in NLP when he developed the concept of submodalities. That means uh, the features, the features of mental images that can be near or far away, can be up there, can be behind someone. And um, Stephen Conneray Andreas pointed out that um, location of mental representations are a feature in the main representational systems. I mean, visual system, a picture always has to be somewhere. You can see that when people point in a certain direction and say, ah, you're talking about, no, I don't want to see that person. So you see gesture and you see a, a direction of the gaze. And uh, you can also ask if someone is talking to, you, to himself like, yeah, you don't should do this or do, do that. From where does this uh, voice come? And some people have it like here, some people have it like uh, in front of them or beside them. And also feeling or, or sensation has location as a feature. So it can be in the body and you feel, for example, anger, you feel in, in this area, you don't feel angry in the elbow. Yeah? Like that. Okay. Is that work? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So I guess it... Yeah, that one goes in, in there. Yeah. It's not always the case when I do this with people. Yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so, and the other one? Yeah. So the, the home, the home. Whereabouts is that? Yeah. Everywhere. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. So everywhere mm. around you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So previously we were looking at specific activities. We also during that session looked at um, broader categories, so what I call life domains. It was something I noticed in my own experience that um, when I was thinking about a broader area of my life, like being a father or being a musician, being a therapist, they, rather than being located in specific places like activities, these categories or domains, if you like, tended to have I found locations um, over broader areas of space. So, is there some time? I mean, what's what does what do you notice about that kind of configuration? Um, I feel sorry for this person. <laughs> That's just all of it overwhelming. Uh -huh. um, um, yeah, I suppose that's kind of how I see it, that I try and put things in this category, whereas this is just everything, you know. Yeah. This is all-consuming and all, uh, you know, all the time. Sure. Okay, so it's hard to, mm. to do some of this sometimes because yeah. it's... Yeah. Yes, because, you know, as it, you, you know, it's even in there, so it's quite... It doesn't necessarily sometimes get to be put over here, like all yeah. nice and neat. Okay, yeah. Mm. So that I mean, that's worth thinking. So that about. makes sense to me. Yeah, so <laughs> it probably doesn't make any sense to you. So it's, it's worth thinking about that you can yeah. move the location. And it's there. interesting. I've already suddenly thought that I didn't actually even realise that I thought of it like that. But that means that already I'm thinking that home stuff isn't necessarily the stuff that needs to be categorised in here. Um, it's this stuff that needs um, scheduling. You know, we talked about scheduling uh -huh. and putting things into times and yeah. when can I do it, when can I think about it. Actually, this is the stuff that needs scheduling. This stuff doesn't really need slotting in because it's just it's there. Not, it's there already. So, okay. Which is interesting because I think I try and slot this stuff in, whereas actually 
it can't be slotted in because wow. it's Thank you. And there's also another law in mental space we can recognize and this this has to do with the angle of view so the more people represent things or persons or memories in the central focal point the more they are occupied with thoughts about that this can be reduced by moving it to the side I'm not really looking so much at the home stuff, even though it's all around. I'm yeah. looking towards the work stuff uh -huh. and seeing, surveying the scene. Yeah. Seeing, surveying <laughs> seeing the scene. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And what happens when you survey the scene? Uh, I can start to see things that you know are part of that um, domain. So it's starting to look like a little city to me now. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> um, like with little kind of, I don't know how to describe, like little buildings. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Is, it, is it possible to take another step? So you're yeah. standing within that. Okay, so now, yeah, now I'm within the domain. Okay. And what do you notice? Um, it's, it's a little bit harder in a way because I'm right in, in it. Yeah. Um, so I can't see everything. Okay. Um, so it's a bit more um, kind of looking at the things that need to be done. Yeah, okay, so it's quite close to your face. Yeah. And you're, uh, it looks like you're wanting it's a to. A bit more overwhelming, yeah. Yeah, so it looks like you're wanting to take a step back. Yeah. One of the patterns we did today in the training is called mind to muscle. And we start with what do you know, what do you understand? So as people do that, I'm always looking to see, do they do it this way, or I know, or I know. And so looking at how they handle space and gesture in space for concept, for knowledge. Then we say, if you know that, do you believe it? So then I'm looking for that. Um, in, in the West, I find most people do something like that. And when I'm in China, Hong Kong, Indonesia, other places, it seems like people do this a lot, I, I believe. And um, when, we, when we have that belief, then we go to decision. And decision could be, you know, so help me God, I'm going to do this. Mm -hmm. Or here's the line in the sand, or here's the point of the decision. And so I'm watching how they use that semantic space and then asking them to notice how they use it and for them to use it intentionally to now drive some concept in. The fourth one is I'm feeling. So sometimes it's I'm feeling, I'm feeling, I'm feeling um, to indicate the emotional state. The last step is given that the, I have this feeling and these emotions, what I'm going to do is. So the one thing I'll do today is. and. And some people will take the index finger and the one thing I'll do today is and then some people is like what I'm going to do or um, what I'm going to do um, so that so the semantic space of taking action when you've done that go back to a specific instance that you can think of in the past it doesn't matter what it is it looks as if you found something already. Yeah, I'm, I'm seven year old and I'm uh, swinging on swinging the on yeah, swing. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. It, it sounds as if you're already doing it. Yes. You're associated yeah. into that yes. action. Yes. Okay. Yes. And when you're doing it, where does, where does that fit in the whole line? Where does that come from? that yeah. way, yeah. a little bit yeah. behind you. Yeah. And then something that uh, NLPers know very well, but also some anthropologists and some philosophers, they have found out that time is represented in a spatial manner. And uh, we can say that it's in fact uh, 
the movement through space, like a child uh, moves through space, this movement through space is used as a metaphor for time. And we have the past, the present and the future. And in the beginning of the movie, we could see how uh, somebody could enlarge the present and then have another experience of presence. Um, of course, there are concrete memories, uh, things that we remember from the past and that we can really know how oh, exactly it went like that. But there are also areas, so let's say school time or uh, kindergarten. Yeah? So that's an area in your past that's not concrete experiences. And so you can also project uh, concrete instances in the future. For instance, the moment that I retire, I can make a beautiful image out of that and uh, project it somewhere in my future. Okay, if you take that belief yes. and just hold on to that for a second, well, where is that belief in the space around us now? Right in front of me. Right in front of you. Yeah. Another law in mental space seems to be that represent, mental representations that are represented above eye level somehow feel a, make the feeling of some dominance from outside. People don't feel in control. They feel that they are overwhelmed by stuff. And if they place the same image down there on the floor, you see that they get a feeling of control again. Come on, would you now think of somebody that you know now or somebody from your past who you find or found to be quite intimidating? Gave you a submissive feeling? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, let, me, let me think for, for a minute. Yeah, take yeah. your time. You don't even have to name the person, that's not important. Important is that you know who it is for yourself. Yeah, I, I think I, I have someone. You've got yeah. someone, yeah. okay. And if you think of how you feel or felt, well, it may have changed in time, but if you think of the time when you had that feeling of submissiveness, of it being an authoritarian mm -hmm. figure, and relive that feeling feelings you had when you were with that person, when you were feeling intimidated. Can you recall that feeling in yourself? Yeah, okay. I, I, I hope I can, but yeah. I think so. Well, just take the time mm -hmm. for it until you're actually starting to feel intimidated again. <laughs> and mm -hmm. when you can relive that feeling to some extent, then I'd like to know where that person pops up in the space around us. I think I'd place him somewhere over there. And in, so you're, or, you're yeah. pointing in front of mm -hmm. you, yeah. more or less, mm -hmm. and you seem to be pointing upwards slightly. Yeah, That'd be great. Yeah, and, that's okay. right. Yeah. And the distance, how far away is he? Um, she? Two and a half meters, maybe. maybe. Yeah. Okay. And uh, where are they looking? Um, um, somewhere over me. They're looking over yeah. the top of you, not, not directly at you. Okay. When we have a relationship with somebody, we tend to uh, think about this as a sort of abstract, a permanent thing. And uh, to create out of, let's say, the ongoing uh, diversity of interactions that we have with people, to create out of that the idea of a permanent relationship, we need to abstract, we need to generalize. And for this, and this is something that we found out already 20 years ago, we use the locations that we put our generalized images of people on. And so, in the social panorama, we have a relation equals location. So the place where I imagine on a steady base a person, the image of a person, creates the 
relationship. Then of course we can also memor memorize specific encounters, uh, so like what Nigel was doing with Kuhn, he was asking him, uh, is there somebody who impressed you, uh, so where you were shy for? And so Kuhn was uh, recreating in his mind this image. This seems to be more the conscious area where representations can become conscious, while behind them, outside of the angle of view, you often find unconscious material. If you think of your father now, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, interesting, yeah, he's um. Yeah, it's, it's the same situation, but he's looking straight at me. Looking yeah. straight at you, okay. Mm -hmm. At eye level? Um, yeah, also, we're also looking directly at each other, same level, yeah. Okay. And then, do you have brothers or sisters? Yeah, one sister and two one, brothers. Yeah. One, two brothers and one sister? Yeah. Okay. Can you place them in the space around you? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Where do they turn up? My sister is, um, in this picture at least, she's one meter away from me. Yeah? Is she closer to you than your parents? No, but I don't know, I, I kind of see my, my siblings in a different light when I look at them together, I guess. But um, I see my sister a meter away, Yeah. and my brothers are two steps behind her. So your brother's a bit behind her. Yeah. And the eye level? Mm. My sister is, yeah, is on the same level as me, but my brothers are a little, they are slightly, yeah, slightly below. Slightly below yeah. your eye yeah. level. Okay. You can do this with a group or work with an individual if you like. Um, just give one very, very simple instruction. Take any selection of coins from there and arrange them to represent your family. Now, what I prefer to do at that point is get up and walk away. Um, if they ask a question, if they want a clarification on something, I completely ignore it. I literally just walk away. Now, sometimes they'll start going, um, arrange them to represent my family? What, what's he talking about? And you can watch them try and work this out and they're not quite sure what this means. Now, this is the important detail. I've never met anyone that doesn't start arranging the coins, and I've never met anyone who just simply refuses to do it. Everyone can do this. So people start, they get the, these coins, they may take a handful, they might take them one at a time, and they'll start putting them, putting them down, and they kind of get these weird configurations in various ways, and then they'll often get rid of the extra coins. Now, what I'll then do is, having once they've arranged it, it's very important, by the way, wait until they've arranged them, and they say, okay, I'm done. Because the amount of people that will arrange them, oh, and then they take another coin, and then they adjust them again. I wait until they call me back, and I go, okay, tell me who's who. They'll often go things like, well, that's me, uh, that's my wife, that's my brother, that's his wife and children, etc., etc. Sometimes people will include pets. Um, that's much more common with younger people, but often because people see the dog as part of the family, they'll often see the cat as part of the family. You get all sorts of additional things in there that aren't necessarily human. And that's all fine. There is nothing right or wrong with how people do this. We go literally with just how they represent it, which is primarily why I get out of the way to let them do this. Now, you start to see some interesting things. For example, you might get, well, that's me and that's my brother. Why the distance? Well, we're not very close. We never have been. Where does your brother live? Oh, he lives two streets away from me. So what we have is not geographical distance, that is emotional distance. We've never been very close. You might get this. Well, that's me and that's my brother. Okay, why, why the distance here? What's going on? Well, we're very close to me and my brother, but he now lives in Australia. So what this relates to is 
geographical distance. Now, there's a certain uniformity that comes with this. So if I've done that's me and that's my brother, we're very close, but he lives in Australia, you're not going to get this. Well, that's me and that's my sister. She lives in the street around the corner from me, but we're not very close emotionally. There's a uniformity. So the distance here will be the same as the distance here. So that would be, she lives just around the corner, but we're not very emotionally close. So you get that kind of thing. Um, if, if this is emotional distance and that's emotional distance, they'll be the same thing. Why did it take so long before the phenomena in mental space were discovered? The main reasons are the 3D landscape of mental representations in which people live, psychologists too, functions largely outside of awareness. It is an unconscious affair and easily overlooked because of its obvious nature. The preferred research tools in psychology test brain scan, computer-aided self-report and observing behaviour are not yet suited for exploring 3D imagery. We have been working on the complex software which allows to model in a virtual environment uh, different mental spaces and social relationships in a single program and it's really flexible there are many things you can uh, you can do and visualize and it can show not only uh, objects but also the different transitions and how you change perspectives and we're seeing a lot of potential for uh, using this in uh, doing research for mental spaces and uh, the main uh, target for us is the internet-based coaching, inter internet-based therapies and also um, we're hoping to create programs for personal development, for personal growth and I think uh, different people from uh, professionals to uh, regular people uh, will benefit a lot from the, uh, from the application.
And in the summer, I really like to go outside with my coaches. And uh, I use nature, I use the spaces in nature as a metaphor for mental spaces. For example, you go outside and you have in mind, I am looking for a situation like my marriage. And you find two trees and one is really small and really a little bit cushed to the ground and the other is really big and spreads out very wide. And so one coach, he said, oh, that's exactly the state my marriage is in and I feel so suppressed and I feel so sad and the, uh, my husband is that big. And so then the trainer says, well, but I mean, think about other aspects. Think about the, um, what you see here, that's maybe just um, a protected space and you don't have to be so exposed like the other one. And then that gives a totally different idea. And so then somebody says, okay, I've never seen it this way. And you can only have this idea when you walk outside and when you use the space. David Grove started to work with his uh, clients' metaphors in the uh, early 1980s. And he quickly realized that the metaphor of space is uh, fundamental to the way people organize their, their inner worlds. And um, one of his earliest clean language questions was the very simple question, and where is? And people would start to gesture and uh, point out where their inner symbols were, their inner metaphors and they could exist outside of them, but also inside in all different parts of the body. And the, um, the question that David pursued for a long time was a very interesting one, which was when people dissociate, where do they dissociate to? And what he discovered was that people can dissociate outside the body, they might go up into a corner, they might go into the uh, pattern on the uh, wallpaper, or they could fragment inside the body. They might go into the heart or to the feet um, as a way of escaping the trauma um, that they were experiencing at the moment. And those aspects of the psyche could be identified, located, and um, reintegrated back into the person's wholeness. Um, and um, initially he was interested in uh, space, particularly inside the body. Then he ventured into perceptual space outside the body. Then he looked at the, the space involved in the intergenerational work. Being a half Maori, he had a very strong sense of uh, spatial aspects and the ancestors going back, 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 back uh, for many, many generations. And um, he also worked with space in terms of physicalizing the internal world. So he developed a retreat center whereby he had a wood, he had a lake, he had a uh, cave. And when people's inner metaphors related to those particular kinds of symbolic uh, context, he would take them into the wood, onto the lake or into the cave to do their piece of work so that their inner world could be made physical. Um, and then what he discovered was that um, actually people quite often were quite comfortable to walk around the physical space of their inner um, symbolic space. And so he had um, people to go to places within their internal world, go to the physical places um, within their internal world. So either they could take their attention to a place or they could physically go to the place within their internal world. Um, and David Grove um, had people draw out their inner worlds and place them in all sorts of wherever was appropriate for them. And, uh, um, and um, in about nine, at the end of 2001, um, while uh, sitting on a container ship of which he was the only passenger crossing over the Pacific Ocean, he had this idea of what if we just use space? 
And so he said uh, to himself, how can I develop a process that only uses space? And that, out of that, a process called clean space was born. Now, the clean in clean space was taken up from uh, clean language. And what makes clean language different is that it's a discipline that prevents the facilitator, the coach or the therapist, from putting any of their language into the inner spaces, the inner world of the client. And so the client ends up creating their own inner landscape, both inside and outside them, that's populated only by their own words and symbols. And when that happens, something very interesting starts to happen. To start with, they don't have to wrestle with the therapist. They don't have to resist the therapist's ideas or suggestions because there are no ideas or suggestions put in. Everything in that inner world is of their own and probably for the first time they come face to face with their own inner reality as created by them. And then something even more marvellous happens is as they become aware of it and that feedback mechanism between their external, their internal world and themselves starts to happen and they have reactions to their own inner symbols that spatial relationships and the uh, relationships between their inner symbolic world starts to change automatically. It's a spontaneous process. Once that happens, they're then surprised by that, and then David Grove's clean language process just keeps that going, just keeps the direction going of that change, and it goes where it goes, and nobody is more surprised than the client or the th therapist. <coughs> or the coach. And the same principles apply in clean space. So it starts with asking people to write or draw a topic of interest. And that piece of paper then is uh, placed wherever the client would like to place it. The instruction is place that where it needs to be. It could be on the ceiling, on the wall, wherever. No other instruction is given. Once the client is comfortable with that space, the next instruction is and place yourself where you are in relation to that. And again, that very simple instruction allows the client to wander around the room or if it's outside, the outside environment, and find the place that is just right for where they need to be in relation to that other piece of work. Now we have two spaces, the paper and the client. a um, process of finding out what the client knows about that and the relationship between them uh, ensues. And then the next clean instruction is given, which is to find another space. And find another space. And so the client, in some way, known only to themselves, finds another space. And what they discover is from that other space, the angles are different, maybe the height is different, Maybe the light is different. Maybe there's something obstructing them that wasn't there before. And the space starts to take on symbolic significance for them. And slowly but surely, these spaces and the content within the spaces are built up into a network design, um, created entirely by the client, but not by design, one by one. And then the client gets a chance to explore that network by moving around from space to space to space and finding out about the relationships between those spaces. And again, something quite remarkable happens is not only does the client start to have landscape, but those relationships start to develop a life of their own. And the client as they move around, discovers more and more, it takes on its own shape, its own configuration. And by the time they come back to the place from whence they started, things look very different, they have a different perspective, and they've discovered what they need to discover without a single word being added or a single suggestion being put in by the facilitator. So in a nutshell, that's clean space.
if you uh, think politically, it's very, very natural to use an inner landscape with two locations, the we and the them. We are the people who think in a similar way as we do. And they are the people who look in a very, very different way. For instance, being a member of a party, it's very natural to have the people of our party there and the people from other parties in, in, a, in a very distant location. There is a special class in this way of thinking which can be called demagogic. How do demagogues use the inner landscape? And which kind of language do they use which triggers inner landscapes in people who believe in them? They have a binary code of we and them. But the distinction between we and them, the natural distinction, is done in a very specific way, namely the we and them are very, very separated. Demagogues use this way of thinking as if they would be people from a different planet or as if they would be uh, beings from a different species. And the, uh, the main arrangement, the main spatial arrangement is done in the following way. They are put above, they are a danger for us, they are overwhelming us, and we have to resist them. We had to fight against them. When a client suffers from a depression, they suffer from something that seems to be quite permanent. And when we look at it in, a, in mental space, we can find that a person who is depressed might have difficulty to represent the future. Uh, so they may have a black future or no future at all. Or they may have traumas that are uh, very vivid around them or they sense the emotions uh, still from a situ situation from maybe 50 years ago or so. But then there's another thing that we encounter that is that people who uh, are depressed may have black clouds, clouds of black matter. And They sometimes call it their black dog. And when we ask them, please uh, call for the, the emotion, the feeling of the depression. And now when they have it, look where there's a black area. And then they may point out an area that might be at the back of them or at the side or in their body or somewhere up above, but nearly never in front of them. So it seems to be that these black uh, areas that they are a phenomenon that shows uh, that there is something repressed. Uh, so a lot of uh, depression seems to be the result of some issue that the person couldn't cope with that they have repressed. And uh, the repression, it's just a neurological phenomenon, I guess, uh, causes the experience of blackness somewhere. When we ask the client to move this black cloud forwards into the center of attention and then we ask them to add uh, sun rays, uh, sunlight to it, the black cloud may dissolve, go away and what comes up is the issue that they couldn't deal with. And now the question is, what should be different for becoming a trainer? So, and what I mean different is we can move them away or closer and we can change the self-images so they may become larger or further away. So there's in, in a way 
multiple gas handles in, uh, okay. involved in this. And mm-hmm. the one is the distance and the direction. Mm-hmm. And one is the size of the self-image. And when you increase the size of the self-image, the part will be more powerful, be more important. Mental space functions as a scaffolding of our cognitive operating system. We build on, up, down, close by, far away, left and right, to simulate reality. And wherever our mind tries to create stability or permanence in our model of the world, it does so by putting things on a steady location. And anywhere the principles of space are used in therapy, it works miracles. However, there is still much more to be explored in mental space. For instance, how do astronomers represent their personal lifetime of 90 years in relation to 50 billion light years? <laughs>